cast your mind back to 1998. What were you doing in that year? if you were even alive. Uh, you might remember Armageddon and Saving Private Ryan hit the cinemas and Google had only just been founded. But it was also the year that construction of the International Space Station began. 13 years later and it was officially complete. Uh, but even now they've still got modules to be added until at least 2015. The ISS sits in a low Earth orbit, currently 255 miles above the Earth's surface, or 46 and a half Mount Everest's up. But every day it actually loses 100 meters of altitude because of air resistance. Yeah, that's right. Despite technically being outer space, there is air still up there. If you think about uh, the size of a sugar cube, uh, outside the ISS, there is about a billion air molecules contained within that volume. That's 10 billion times less than the air that you and I breathe down here. Left unchecked and the International Space Station would crash into the Earth. Uh, in fact, that's what's going to happen in 2020 when it retires to a watery grave. But for the time being, they have to boost it up from time to time, uh, usually after it's fallen about 65 miles or 12 Everests. So how do you get up to the International Space Station? Well, I'm, I'm sure you know the answer to that. You take a rocket. Currently, the only way that astronauts and cosmonauts can get up there is on board a Soyuz capsule, which is launched by a Soyuz rocket. These were designed by the Russians in the 1960s, though they have been updated quite a bit since then. Now, it's fueled by a combination of liquid oxygen and a highly refined sort of kerosene, which is called RP-1. Now, that stands for either Rocket Propellant 1 or Refined Petroleum 1. I prefer the last one, to be honest. When it's ignited, high pressure builds up inside the rocket's engine and forces exhaust out at extremely high speeds. Now, Newton's third law says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and therefore you get a nice thrust acting on your rocket. Now, that thrust has to overcome the rocket's weight, its gravitational attraction to the Earth, otherwise it's not going anywhere. And, and that's really all there is to rocket science. I don't know why they make it out to be so hard. The Soyuz capsule starts slightly lower down than the ISS, meaning it's actually going faster than it. And it performs over the course of 34 orbits, just three burns to be able to come in for that gentle docking. Except this takes two days. That's two days stuck inside a space eight times smaller than the average UK room size. And there are three of you. Uh, doesn't sound too pleasant to me. So why does it take so long to get there? Well, if you've played one of those Lunar Lander sort of video games, you might have an idea at the answer. It's usually best to take things slowly and be efficient with fuel rather than go really fast and have to whack the thrusters in reverse as you're coming in for a docking. That doesn't mean we can't get to the ISS a bit faster though. In fact, back in March, they were able to do it in under the time it takes to fly from London to New York, just under six hours and only four orbits. Uh, and the way you have to do that is all about timing. You need to have the ISS in the right place, do all your precise operations in a much shorter amount of time. And the ISS has to do a bit of the legwork for you as well. It sounds strange, but instead of you going to the ISS, the ISS sort of has to come to you. It boosts itself up by about three miles to just be in the right place for the Soyuz rockets. Now that we've shown that this fast track route to the ISS works, um, well, we can take it on a case by case basis which way we're going to go. And the next time they're going the fast way. Volare, which means to fly in Italian, excuse the bad accent, is the European Space Agency's next mission to the International Space Station, where Luca Parmitano, one of the new generation of ESA astronauts, will be spending six months on the ISS. He'll be working on 20 experiments, ranging from human physiology, uh, biology, to fluid physics and material science. And you can find out more about this mission on our live Google Plus Hangout on Tuesday the 28th of May at 1pm UK time, where we'll be talking to Paolo Nespoli. And we want one of you to join us, so why not send in your questions for Paolo in the comments below or on Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe as well for all the latest info. Oh.